honest. I hope you can hear the disappointment in that. Whether you made that plea as a child or heard it as a parent or both, you know the feeling and the reason behind it. Mom and dad are fallible, sinful people. Circumstances change. Things happen. Promises are broken. Rather naively, Hannah Arendt suggests promises are the uniquely human way of ordering the future, making it predictable and reliable to the extent that that is humanly possible. I'm not quite so sure. A little more realistically, Twain observed, to promise not to do a thing is the surest way in the world to make a body want to go and do that very thing. Experience has taught us that if promises are made not to be broken, they probably will be anyway. With God, it is a different matter. And that is particularly evident in our Old Testament reading for this morning. In verse 7, we hear of a unique form of promise. God Almighty, El Shaddai declares, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. A covenant is a form of a promise, and as a parallel to last week's burnt offering, it also first appears in the biblical record in the story of Noah. But unlike the burnt offerings that Noah offered up after the deluge, he entered the ark secure in this covenant, this promise. Following the description of the coming cataclysm, God unilaterally declared, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Once the sun shines again and the ground dries up and Noah offers burnt offerings, then God greatly expands that covenant. It includes you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. Genesis 9. And God seals the covenant with a sign. I have set my bow in the clouds. The signing and the sealing of the covenant become the focus of the central part of our reading, the matter of circumcision. But first, what is this covenant? While we see the seal and the sign of the Noachian covenant frequently here in Tillamook, the rainbow, the covenant with Abram is a different matter. God makes a promise to Abram back in Genesis chapter 12 when he calls him out of the land of Haran, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Abram goes with a handful of promises land, offspring, blessings, and a future blessing. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He leaves with the promise of the Messiah, but no covenant. That comes in chapter 15. As Abram came to, Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, after expressing his concern about an heir, Yahweh takes him outside and says, look towards the heavens. Number the stars if you are able to number them. So shall your offspring be. Abram believed Yahweh, who counted it to him as righteousness. We heard the promise, now the covenant sealing. Abram's told to gather a heifer, a female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon, the notary public of the ancient Near East. Let me explain. Abram cuts the animals in half and lays the two halves opposite each other. Normally, the two parties of the covenant would walk between the halves, promising, so let it happen to me if I do not fulfill my part of the covenant. Normally. But that night, a dreadful and dark fe darkness fell upon him. Abram slept as God, as a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, passed between the animals. Yahweh sealed the covenant. So let it happen to me. Our text is not a new covenant, but an advance of the one sealed by the animals in the smoking fire pot in chapter 15. What was in force then, that your, own, your very own son shall be your heir, would now become operative. Verse 16, I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. God comes to make the former covenant operative. 
And once again, he gives a sign and a seal to this covenant. In fact, he gives them two new names. No longer shall they be Abram and Sarai, but Abraham and Sarah. And he commands the seal of circumcision. He puts a mark in Abraham's flesh. So shall my covenant be with in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. But it all depends on a son. The promise of a son is no son. A promise cannot beget children, let alone nations. A promise cannot bring forth kings, let alone the king. But that's what Yahweh came to announce. The time is at hand. Get the nursery ready. Blue carpets all around. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? That's the very next verse after our reading. What do we do with Abraham's laughter? One Lutheran commentator suggested that Abraham fell on his face in an act of worshipful adoration. Also, his laughter is the laughter of joy and surprise. Luther also follows that line of reasoning. I'm not so sure. I hear a tone of incredulity. It's too good to be true. There must be some catch. Did you read the fine print? And there it is, right at the beginning of our reading. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you. There's the catch. Abraham may have slept as God passed through the animals, as God signed the covenant, but, but Abraham, now Abraham, must be blameless. The King James reads, Be thou perfect. It's a question of works. It's a question of behavior. What do you do when the standard is perfection? That's the standard in the text. That's the standard that Jesus requires in the Sermon on the Mount. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew chapter 5. What do you do? I can see two options. First, you can change the standard. Find the loophole. Make the exception. We're all good at that. It's called grading on the curve. We point to our neighbor and his or her obvious fall from grace. Or we confess our own sordid past and celebrate the progress that we've made. That's good for some credit, isn't it? No. Perfect is perfect. So we shift to plan B. Find a scapegoat. Someone or something on which to lay the blame. My environment, my friends, my parents. It's their DNA, after all. What about the father of lies? The devil himself? Or circumstances, it was the lesser of two evils, or it was for the greater good, anything or everything, to deflect the blame, to soften the bullet uh, verdict, to dodge the bullet. What do you want? What we can't, what we don't want, what we can't bear, are the words of confession. I, a poor, miserable sinner, Confess unto you all my sins and iniquity, with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But we have no choice. We are guilty. Sisters and brothers, God can't back off. He can't grade on the curve. He can't because he's holy. Leviticus 19, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The psalmist declares, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before you. You hate all evildoers. In our day, many have lost sight of God's holiness. But while our perception, our attitude may change, not God. The Ten Commandments are not multiple choice. His standard is absolute. If God can't fudge the standard, then it must be plan B, a scapegoat. Last week we discussed at length the Old Testament Day of Atonement and the scapegoat that carried the sins of the people out into the wilderness. The ritual of that day, the tenth day of the seventh month, year after year, did two things. It expiated sin, that it is removed the guilt of sin, and second, it appropriated God, it restored his good pleasure. The Day of Atonement ritualized the promise made way back in Genesis 12 that in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Luther suggested that promise should be written in gold letters and should be extolled in the languages of all people. 
for it offers eternal treasures, close quote. The promise that first appeared to Eve, then to Noah, and now Abram, later to Isaac and Jacob and Judah. The promise appears again in David, to David, as Nathan declares, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. The promise remains, though the promise bearer is obscure during the years of exile and the intertestamental period. Then an angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah as he serves in the temple. El Shaddai, God Almighty, who compels nature to do what is contrary to its, itself, subdues it to conform to his will, to administer his grace. He will give Elizabeth a child in her old age, as he had done with Sarah. Then the same angel, Gabriel, appeared to Mary. Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And again, nature is compelled to do what is impossible, and the promise became flesh. But the promise is still promise and not atonement until Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. I-N-R-I. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The promise made to Sarah. Kings of people shall come from her. The promise reiterated to Judah and David, written on papyrus and nailed to a Roman instrument of death. One of the criminals railed against him. Are you not the Christ? Are you really the promise bearer? Then save us. But the other rebuked him and then asked, Remember me. And he heard that glorious word. Today. The promise was kept today in paradise and on earth. The promise continues to be kept here today in this place. In the words of absolution, I forgive you all of your sins. In his name, the name of the promise. Luther continues, who else shall we say was dispensing this promise among all nations except the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ? This blessing, this promise, not only for all people, but for all time. Luther concludes, it will endure until the end of the world, since the gates of hell, tyrants, and ungodly men will oppose it and rage against it in vain. But to return to the Old Testament... The covenant, the promise was sealed in Genesis 15 by ritual act as Abram slept. In Genesis 17, the circumcision was made operative, the covenant was made operative, and again, signed and sealed with new names and circumcision. You and I were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, Colossians 2, having been buried with Christ in baptism and made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. God sealed his covenant of salvation unto us in the sign of baptism. God has kept his promise. Therefore, we can trust all the promises of God. The promise of his presence, I will never leave you or forsake you, Joshua 1. The promise of his power and protection, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, Isaiah 41. The promise of his guidance, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, John 10, the promise of his wise plan. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, Romans 8. So we can say with Corey Ten Boom, let God's promises shine on your problems. Amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the offertory on page 192. Would you please stand? <laughs> 